The first dry fly fished in America was in Roscoe. Record. One that hist all historians, not all historians, but historians say that's the first example of dry fly fishing on the Wooloima. That's where he was like, damn it, they're not biting these sucky flies. I better tie some good ones. Yeah. So we're at the birthplace place of the dry fly. The Willow what? Willow Emoc. Willow Weemoc. Willow Weemoc. The first yeah. thing in print is Norris's like said, uh, uh, experience. And this is what Norris said. Criteria for dry fly fishing. The flies were false cast for the purpose, quote, intentional drying of the fly. And his remarks on drying the fly are the most important features of his work. But this incident is considered the first in print. It was a big deal. Oh, it's the biggest of deals if you like fly fishing. Welcome to another exciting episode of Fishing with Jay. Today is the day. We've been hot on the trail trying to figure out where American fly fishing came from. And I'm in the Catskills, running around meeting everybody I possibly could, asking all the stories. And it turns out this is the home of dry fly fishing. Birthplace of the dry fly. You know what that means? Uh, this is where the dry fly is from. Dry fly is something that floats on the top of the water. What's magic about that is that you're going to fly fish uh, for a large part for the interaction with wildlife. And when it happens on top of the water, where you can actually see it happen, it, it, it really connects you to these things. We've been guided by Jeff White. This is 20 years on the Delaware. He's been running the Delaware River Club for a whole stack of time. And we're trying to figure out like, where did fly fishing start in America? And it just so happens an authority on that concept is Jeff. It's kind of always caught my interest. I just found the local history fascinating. It's going to be a little bit of a challenge figuring all this stuff out because of all the people that passed away. <laughs> it's going to be tough. Going to be there, tough. there aren't many left. What should we be looking for? I would try to get on the trail of Theodore Gordon, who was one of the first uh, Americans to try to take English dry fly patterns and, and make them work on these rougher rivers where they would still float. Make better floating flies based on the insects that he was seeing here on the rivers in the Catskills. You can trace his knowledge to ink. Really interesting guy and there's still a lot of correspondence between him and some of the English dry fly authors. Um, so there's a lot of information out there on him that's really cool. He's our, he's our Babe Ruth, is that the idea? He is. Everybody in the Catskills looks for the Quill Gordon Hatch as the first large mayfly of the spring. And that was one of the first and most famous insects that he tied flies to represent. Is that a slate drake? No, slate drakes and Isonychia. Quill Gordon is, um, that's kind of the common name of it now. But oh, it's, really? it's, a, oh, cool. it's a dark gray body, mayfly, two tails. It's actually uh, Epiorus pluralis is the Latin for the bug nerds. He tied probably the first American dry fly, purely American dry fly using strip peacock quill um, and the split um, wood duck wings, which, oh, cool. which you see is a very common theme in Catskill flies. I think some of that came from England and he adapted it to, you know, like the birds he found here to use the feathers. The quill Gordon. See how it's a quill? It's, it's a Gordon. The Catskill style dry fly. I don't even know if that's seeable. They ride real high, and probably back in the day, it didn't matter so much, brookies, and trimming off the bottom of the hackle, this, this little zone, trimming off the bottom of that, makes them ride a little bit more flush on the water instead of so high up. Covered bridge pool. This stretch of the Beaver Hill was a favorite of Theodore Gordon. 
1854 and 1915, fly fisher, fly tire, and creator of the Quill Jordan, one of the first purely American dry flies. But he wasn't the first guy. He's not credited with being the first guy who uh, fished the dry fly. He came from a, a wealthy family when he was young, and he had a, a, a great growing up, and he was well educated. And Gordon was somewhat of a recluse. He was, like died really young. He had consumption, like tuberculosis, kind of like Jimmy Rogers. I've got the team. We've been on the trail of Theodore Gordon. It's, it's be a really cool uh, opportunity to learn more about the castle. Do you think this is what it was like when Gordon was fishing this zone? I think you had a lot of wild brook trout that were uh, happily feeding on the huge amount of insects in, these, in this river system. Probably started stocking the browns to make up for I mean, besides the mass slaughter of brook trout uh, from the fishermen, uh, also the habitat, you know, the habitat changed as they uh, deforested the land. The rivers warmed up a little bit and brown trout thrived while the native brookies um, kind of got relegated to the headwater streams. Of course, the English put brown trout everywhere they possibly could. Um, so this was just kind of a natural extension. I've kind of spent my whole life chasing after fish in their indigenous zone. And while I love brown trout and rainbow trout, indigenous fish, no matter what they are and where they swim, are just always a little bit more interesting to me. And here the indigenous fish is the brook trout. I'm gonna try to catch a brook trout on a quill gordon in the waters, the, the original waters where this thing was tied. It's all plunge pool, real small water. It's really cool. Like, I, I can say when I started out, I fished a lot of this kind of water. Just small stuff catching tiny fish. And as I got older, it became less interesting to me. Coming back to it now, it's, it's a delight. The, <laughs> the speed and, and, and feeling of it. Cool. This is a real deal brookie, guys. Cool. There's a lot of pretty fish in this world. I put them in the top 10 of, of prettiest fish in the world. One of the most beautiful fish I've ever witnessed. To have a chance to cast a quill gordon for the indigenous fish of this area on a little stream like oh. this, absolutely beautiful. It feels like where fly fishing came from, at least dry fly fishing in, in the way that we're doing it. Wicked cool. Pulling up to the Catskills Fly Fishing Museum. It's this is kind of a monumentous moment for me. Uh, I've never been in a fly fishing museum. Holy smokes! Lots of uh, lots of history up in here. I'm on the search for where American fly fishing came from. American fly fishing depends where you ask. And what we found was uh, this is indeed where he first tied the first American dry fly. And this is the first place where Theodore cast yeah. the dry fly. People in this area, in the Never Sink, so Beaverkill, Willowemock area, so kind of taking what he did and adding to it. Dry fly fishing. It's been a long time for old Jay. I happened to get my first brown trout on the Delaware River with my homies. Oh, and I needed that. I needed that. Thank Through the you generations, so you end up with Deddy's Fly Shop that far in the future, still operating on those river systems. 93 years, the shop has always been rooted in the Catskills. Um, it's been, it was founded by a husband and wife team who loved the area, who wanted to see it prosper, who wanted to see it be protected and preserved. And that just carried over to their daughter Mary, um, to her children, and eventually Mary's grandchild, Joe Fox, who's a fourth generation, um, my partner, life partner, and work, work and business partner. Everybody moved west. Of course, they, they adapted everything to the rivers they were finding. A couple nice. hundred years later, you have chubby Chernobyls, which is still cool because it's still dry fly fishing. 
We definitely don't have Chevy Chernobyls, that's before our time, but we do have classic wet flies and the quintessential Catskill dry fly. No scurvy worbies, no mop flies. We have a network of tires that work with the shop and work with us, and it's uh, pretty nice to know the hands and the face that tied those flies. Another uh, great historical figure who's still living here on the Delaware is Al Gucci, and he would definitely be worth your time to talk to. Theodore Gordon was the first great. Al Cucci changed the world again in the world in the ways of fly tying and approaching aquatic insects in a, a scientific way. Him and Bob Nastasi wrote the book Hatches, which is basically the Bible of fly fishing bugs. Hoping he's gonna have some information on the first dry fly here and maybe even see to where it went from there. I don't know if you guys have heard of the, the fly called the Comparadon, where it really matched what a mayfly looked like. Well, he invented it. I'm gonna knock on the door and see if he would be interested in having a yap. Okay guys, so I'm at the, the legend of aquatic entomology. He's written the Bibles on how how we interact with fish, and which, and which is through the bugs. That's what we call it, fly fishing. Still on the quest, and uh, I got an opportunity to talk with Al Cucci, so. So, so I haven't told this. Uh, <laughs> a long time, huh? Not a long time. Yeah, it's, it's, Maybe 20 years. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, people just aren't interested. What, what we did was married the entomology and the fishing and the trout and everything together. Caddis are important, mayflies are the most important. The mating takes place in midair. So the males will undulate near a riffle because they like to lay their eggs in a riffle and it's highly oxygenated where they know it's, the, it'll fall into the rocks and and the eggs will hatch. And in most cases, it takes 21 instars through their lifespan. And their lifespan is almost exactly 365 days. The mergers, who, uh, who kind of broke, the, broke that open? Mm -hmm. I did. So the trout will key on the most vulnerable aspects being that it's, it's easy to eat without them flying away or moving away. I used to have aquariums for every river I fished, and I used to study an aquarium and tape it on you know, the cassettes. And when certain hatches came, see, we had list. We had to get the nymph, the dun, and the spinner of each species that we were gonna deal with. So sometimes I would get the hatches coming off in that house and I would have a PVC screen on top of it with some twigs so I could just cling to it. And I would call Bob and say, well, we got EPRS vitreous and we don't have the spinner, we don't have the dun. And he'd say, oh shit. I said, well, you know, you got a day or two if you want to get these pictures, okay? So he would come over to the house and we set up our photography stuff, similar to what you're doing. Seventy percent of what we found out, and most of it we managed to get into these books that nobody else knows except entomologists. But they're they're not familiar with mayflies because there's there's no economics involved in mayflies. Our patterns like dominated the scene because we've made them out of deer hair. and You could catch a dozen fish and, and still have the same fly. Just rinse it out, get a paper towel, squeeze it, throw it out there, you know. Uh, I met Bob and Otto in 71, and we formed a company. Otto would, would do the distribution part of it, and uh, Bob would do the photography and the art. Every weekend we went out and, because we had regular jobs, did all our research all over the East Coast, Midwest. He died in 2004, 
We got inducted in the Hall of Fame in 2006. I'm sure he's looking down on us right now. You know? He died from cancer. When he was fading, I, I would have some tears in my eyes when I would talk to him. He says, look, I know you're upset. Just don't worry about it. He says, I'm happy. We did what we did. And I'm happy I moved here and what you did for me here. He says, the most happiest times of my life were the last five years I had here at the campground. This made me feel a lot better.